Father, I just thank you that today you are with us. God, I thank you for all the hearts that are here today, all the lives represented there, all the families that are presented here today. God, and I thank you that today, God, you are always moving, always working, always up to something greater than what we've experienced, God. And I know that you're, you're a God who won't just leave us where we're at because you're taking us to where you need us to be. And so God, I ask you today, have your way. Father, I just commit the next 30 minutes to you and I ask you, Father, that your word would be spoken like only you can speak it because when your word goes out and you speak, Father God, lives are, are restored Death becomes life, God. Hope, beca hopelessness becomes hope. Brokenness becomes wholeness, God. And I ask you that today, right now, in Jesus' name, that every heart would be ready to receive the word that you have for them. Because Holy Spirit, you know exactly where everyone is and you can do a work that only you can do. And so we say, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever been in a conversation where you're speaking to somebody and then halfway through it, you're going, wait, sorry, sorry, what? You've lost me. What, were, what are we talking about? Have you ever had that? That happens a lot. Like I'll be telling Denver a lot of stuff. Sometimes I speak a lot. And um, we'll be talking and, and then he'll go, yes, but I'm like, but that wasn't even the point. And he'll pick up on a point that had nothing to do with the story, but because of details and the framework and the background, that's what he saw and he missed the main picture. Because sometimes, you know, you use too many words. I do. Have you guys noticed? <laughs> Thanks, Micah. <laughs> it gets lost in the blah, blah, blah. And, um, but the thing is, is that we've all been there before where you're like laughing or you're laughing with somebody and you're like, I actually don't know what we're laughing at anymore. Have you ever been there? So I want to jump back into the story of, of Moses and the Israelites. We've, been, we've started a little conversation around these things. And the last time we spoke, we spoke about who, who are you and who do you play for? And um, I believe that God's going to take us on a bit of a journey. And then we had Simon here last week and it was such a privilege. Just, you know, having him on platform and, and sharing his heart and sharing the word is one thing, but then actually being able to do life alongside somebody like that. And we did a team night. For those of you who don't know, team night is open to anybody. So next time, pull in. And uh, he just shared his heart and having conversations and, and it's exciting to see what God is doing and, and, and just what God can do with a life that surrendered to him. It's, it's beautiful and it's encouraging and inspiring. But today I wanna to jump back in to our story, to the account, to the, the lessons we can learn from Moses and the Israelites and their journey. Because like we said, their journey is our journey and it's not too dissimilar. And some of us might find ourselves in the exact same place of a burning bush experience. I wanna know, you need to Instagram it, Facebook it and put it all over social media because that's the God we serve. But I wanna jump back into Exodus 3. So what's happening is Moses flees and he's like, I'm out of here. Egypt's not for me. These guys are treating my people badly. He kills somebody, so he has to flee for his life. And then he's just tending flocks. He's made his life comfortable. He found a wife. He's like out in the outskirts in the back, back of, the, of the desert. And then God meets with him. And he, he calls him into a place. And what happens is, I'm going to jump between because there's quite a bit of scripture for us to get through today. And what happens is, he calls to Moses, he says, Moses, Moses, come closer. And what happens is he presents himself in a burning bush. And first of all, Moses is like, what is this? I mean, imagine starting a conversation that big. It's not just a, hey, how are you? What's your name? Where do you come from? How's your week been? It's, it's like, Phew. there's something happening. Side effects are fantastic, guys. Joel's like, whoa, I didn't know you had that in you. I do, Joel. I've got lots in me. And, uh, and so he sits there, Joel's teasing me about my singing, guys. You need to back me. Any case. And so he says, so God speaks to Moses, says, Moses, Moses, in this burning bush that's not burning up. And Moses takes off his shoes and he says, here I am, God. What, what is it? I'm, I'm okay. And he recognizes that God is speaking to him. He's not, he's not run a mile. We've just got a cat. Guys, it's kitten season, apparently. You all need to get a cat. Let me just tell you, in the late night, early hours of this morning, I looked at this cat while I was preparing and I was like, it's a cat. <laughs> it's not a dog. <laughs> I'm a puppy person. I'm a dog person. But anyway, the, do the kids love it. But um, 
this morning, we, you know, you go into the thing, they're skitty. Cats don't, there's a uh, connection. And uh, missing. And so you walk into the room and it's like, jumps up against the wall and it's out and it runs into the wall because it doesn't know where the door is and stuff like that. Moses didn't respond to God like that. He was like, okay, it's a burning bush. It's talking to me, I better respond. And so he was ready and his heart responded to God. That, don't get lost in the background, right? In the beautiful picture I'm painting. So he says this thing to God and God says, Moses, you need to, you need to listen to this, take off your sandals because what I'm about to tell you is great. And so he starts to use Moses, he says, Moses, this is my plan. I've heard the Israelites. There's a nation crying out to me and they need somebody to do something and so I'm gonna do something. But wait for it, Moses, it's gonna be you. And so Moses is like, okay, okay, God, I hear you. And so God starts telling him about this plan that he has, that he's going to deliver a nation, change the empire structure of Egypt so that they can release the people, but he's going to use Moses. And Moses goes, okay, God, um, can you give me a bit more detail? And so what happens is God, he's like, who am I? Remember last week or the week before? We've got to know that question. We, know, we need to know the answer to the who are you? Because right there in the moment when God says, I've, I've got this amazing plan and you're part of that assignment, our, our immediate normal human response is, but who am I that you would use me? And the answer is always, you are because I am. And so straight up from the beginning of the conversation, God says to him, I am. And so he's like, okay, okay, so you are, and you're going to go with me, and we're going to change this nation, and I'm going to be the vessel that you use. And, and he says, but, but how, God? And God goes, what's in your hand? Now, don't switch off because we've all heard a story, the account, a message, probably powerful messages on what's in your hand and give it to God and stuff. So I don't want you to switch off right now because I am going to speak about that for a moment to, to build into what I believe God wants us to understand this morning. But he says to him, what is in your hand? And so they're having this whole conversation. And so God goes from, you're going you're to overthrow this nation. You're going to set my people free. I'm going to go with you. What's in your hand? And he goes, a stick. And he goes, a shepherd's stick, a staff. He's like, yeah. And God goes, okay, use that. He goes, sorry, sorry, what are we talking about? What? Like how does what I have in my hand line up with this incredible assignment of, like, like it doesn't actually line up, God. You've just told me that we're going to, go and overthrow a nation and set an entire people free and you're telling me to use something like a stick. And so there's this, this disconnect on what God is trying to establish. But watch what happens. See, the thing is, this stick, this staff, if you read through Exodus 3 and just read this account, it is a faith building account. You know, you jump into Hebrews and, they, and there's, the, there's the whole thing of faith and building faith and it says, when your faith starts to flag, Anybody's faith ever started a flag? It says, go back and remind yourself. Go back and remind yourself of these things that God has done. You know, like when Mary gets to that point where it's, he, she's, she's at that moment where God starts his ministry and it says she just kept those things in her heart. There's a process that God allows us to go through so that we can remember things that we need to remember on the times that he needs us to remember. It's like, it's like downloading from heaven going, I remember that, I remember that, I remember that, you know? And so he says, take the stick. Now I want you to remember, now it's not just a stick, guys, it's a staff. But I just wanna say, it doesn't matter what your gift or your talent or whatever it is, at the end of the day, it is not comparable to the greatness of the assignment God has given you. It doesn't matter how great you are, it's not gonna be the thing that's gonna actually deliver the people. It is God gonna use the thing that's in your hand to do the work that he needs to do. We just need to be ready to hand it over. So what happens is, last week when, we, when I was here, I mean, I've been here every week, but you know what I mean. When we spoke about who are you and who do you play for, it is God. It is God, who are you? You are because he is the great I am. That needs to be settled in our hearts. The second thing is, who do you play for? It's like, it's the assignment that he's called you for. He's called you, he's positioned you, and you're already in the game. But today I wanna ask you another question. What is in your hand? See, the assignment God has for you is not dependent on how great the thing is in your hand or how pathetic the thing is in your hand. It's dependent on what God will do if you allow him to use that. He'll take whatever it is and he'll use it for his glory. And if it happens to be something as simple as a stick, 
put it down before God because He can use it. See, the thing is that we're going to see here in a moment, we're going to do a bit of a comparison between the life of Moses and the life of Pharaoh. And in both moments, in both conversations, and in both stories, God asks them to give something, to let something go to drop something, to hand it over, to put it before him, both of them. So before we get to Pharaoh, I want to speak about Moses. Moses has a stick and the stick is not going to lead the nation out of, of Egypt. But God says, I will use it. I will use it, but I'm going to ask you, this thing, you need to throw it before me. This thing that you can use for your glory, for your purpose, throw it before me. This thing that you might despise, put it down before me. What is it? that you've got in your hand. And the thing is, sometimes we go, what is it we got in our hand, my talent? My... But I want to even extend and go, what is it that you've got in your heart? Because before you can actually even put the thing that you've got in your hand before God, he's going, you know, there's a deeper work. Let's just, what's in your heart? Is it thoughts of self-doubt? Is it thoughts of inadequ- inadequacy? Is it, is it anything that would, you know, you would build up or, or take away? There's another scripture in the Bible that says, do not think too highly or too less. It's just, it's that perfect balance. Constantly God wants to bring that perfect balance. What is it? Because I'm asking you right today, put it before me. Because the assignment doesn't change. The assignment that Moses had is the exact same assignment we have, maybe just packaged differently. He says, go out and go and tell the nations about me so that they do not have to live in captivity, so that they're not destined for a life separated from me. And we need to bring them out. We need to be part of that assignment. It's the exact same assignment. And so he says, what do you have in your hand today? So whatever it is, throw it down before God because God says to him, Moses, chuck it down, put it down on the ground and watch what I will do with it. And only when he releases it, that's when the change happens. That's when something different happens. That's when he sees God do a miracle right before his eyes. But as the thing that struck me is when you, you carry on reading is that, is that we actually have to ask ourselves the question, is like, are we willing to let go of this thing? Or will we just think, oh, it means nothing? Because although it might be something that could help you, it could also be something that can hinder you. Limitations. What if, what if God says, I need you to let go of that thing, that, that mindset, that, that, that thing that you've held on to, a behavior, a habit, whatever it is, it could be positive or negative. He's like, would you put it down before me so that I can show you what I can do in your lack, in your brokenness, in your overqualification in a certain area? We need, to, we need to be ready to let go of small mindsets and old behaviors and consciously and continuously lay down before God what only He can do. Because at the end of the day, He's not worried about what's in our hands. He's worried about what's in our hearts. He's like, if you would lay it down, I'm gonna do something. And the whole mandate that I love, He's like, Moses, we're gonna, we're gonna go and get them so they can worship me. We're gonna go and get those people so they can worship so we can, we can be one again, we can worship God. And so the whole thing is reconciliation, coming back to the relationship that God ultimately created us for. And so you never know what God's gonna do when we say, okay, I'll leave it, I'll drop it down. I, I, you know, some translations say, throw it down. And he just chucks it down and God does something with it. But the thing is, if you're in that same place going, I'll do it, but God, I don't see the connection. Let me just remind you, Moses had a stick. These are just a few that came to mind. David had a slingshot. Joshua and Caleb had a bit of guts. Nothing fancy. Joseph had a dream. And some of you just have a dream. And God's going, will you put it down? Will you put it down? And watch what I will do with it. Will you use what you've skilled in? Because there's so much skill and giftings and talent in this place. Would you use that? And then see what I will do. Would you... You know that that thing of, I'm not going to give up, Joshua and Caleb, I'm not going to give up, God. I'm going to hang on to what you've done, that bit of grit, that bit of courage, that little bit of, you know, something that sets them apart from the rest of the nation. He goes, if you could just hang on to that. Because it doesn't go into what skills they had. They weren't, you know, they weren't labeled as the major fighting men and stuff. They were just part of the army. They were the guys that said, okay, whatever it takes, you know, we'll do these things. We'll, we'll, We'll hang on to that. What could your thing be and what could God do with it? See, because what we do in those moments does determine what's going to follow. See, watch what happens. Remember we spoke about the stick, the staff, the thing that he has in his hand? 
if you carry on reading, it gets to the point where God says to him, okay, Moses, this is what's going to happen. And Moses watches God do a miracle with the thing that he puts before God. And he says, now you're going to use that thing, that thing that you might despise or that thing that you might depend on. And you're going to use it and you're going to take it to Pharaoh and you're going to watch what I'm going to do. And so he does. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, this is my assignment. Let the people go. Let them go so they might worship. Let them go so they might have a relationship with God. Let them go so that we can walk this journey of reconciliation, discipleship, letting them know who God is and who created them. And so what happens is he goes in and the first thing he does is he drops the staff, it becomes a snake and, and Pharaoh's like, whatever, big deal, my magicians can do it too. And, but what happens is his heart is hardened and God says to him, I'm gonna harden his heart, Moses. I can't tell you all the details, but I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna harden his heart because there's a work that I need to do in that nation and it's gonna require some you know, brutal moments. And so I'm gonna allow that, but I just want you to know, I'm not gonna tell you how it's gonna happen, but I'm just telling you this is why it's gonna be harder. And so Moses goes in and he says to, to, to Pharaoh, do this. And Pharaoh's first response is, now, why would I do that? I don't know your God. I don't know who he is. He's your God. He means nothing to me. So you can threaten me with him, his name. It, it actually had no consequence to Pharaoh. He had no idea that he was dealing with the living God. And so it mean, meant nothing. And so what happens is Moses then goes on and, he's, and he says to him, okay, fine. This is your warning. And if you don't listen, this is what's going to happen. And so he goes to the Nile and, and you know, Pharaoh's having a fantastic day on his boat and whatever, turns the water into blood. Everything, the Nile River, the water, the jars, every single thing that they would try and drink from wells turns into blood. The magicians can do it too, but they can't turn it back. So he goes, oh, this is ridiculous. Doesn't get his attention. The second strike, he says, okay, Mo, he says, okay Pharaoh, he didn't listen to me, but let me, let me um, show you something else. God says, he's gonna send frogs frogs everywhere, on your head, on your plate, under your pillows, on your bed, wherever it is, you're gonna have frogs everywhere. And so he starts freaking out. He's like, can you just make this stop? Whatever you want, whatever you want, make it stop. How easy it is in those moments when things are not comfortable for us and there's a frog on our plate, then we're thinking, this is not what I signed up for. Please, can you get me out of here? And it's easy to pray prayers in those moments. God, I'll never do that again. And then what happens is there's a bit of relief. Moses goes, okay, fine. I'll pray, I'll, I'll take it away, and we revert back to our old ways. But listen to this. It's, it's an astounding, astounding piece of scripture. So what happens is, he goes and he speaks to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, whatever, I don't know who this God is, I'm not scared of him. And then he goes, okay, you've got my attention, frogs, frogs. My magicians can do it, but they can't get rid of them, just get rid of them. If you can get rid of them, I'll give you what you want. And this is what he says. So Moses says to him, okay, Pharaoh, fine. When do you want this? When do you want this to all stop? When do you want me to pray? He says, I'll leave it up to you. What is it that you're going to do? Like, when do, when do you want this to stop? And Pharaoh's response is, Moses says to Pharaoh, I, I leave it to your honor, the setting of the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that your houses may be rid of all these frogs, except those that remain in the Nile. He says, so Pharaoh, you set the time. When would you like me, this this thing, this oppression, this frustration, this irritation, these frogs to stop. And then Pharaoh goes, tomorrow. What a response. Today, he's living with frogs around him. Today, he's in the midst of going, I don't even know how to live like this. But he doesn't take care of it. He goes, okay, tomorrow. So I'll live with it a little bit longer. He postpones, he delays. He delays an, a situation that is so horrible. I mean, frogs, guys. But he doesn't say right now, actually, can you just take care of it right now? I don't want this in my life. I don't want this in my kingdom. I don't want this in my empire. I never want to see a frog in my life again. He goes, okay, can we just postpone it for one more day? Like, let's, let's live with frogs for one more day. Why would, why would we allow ourselves to stay in a place where there's frustration, irritation, oppression, depression. I'm not talking about illnesses and stuff. I'm talking about, you know, there's, hear what I'm saying. Like, why would we stay in a place willingly when God goes, I've given you a way out. Tomorrow, God. Tomorrow I'll deal with this. Tomorrow. When this and this and this falls into place. When things happen the way I want it to be. When, when it all makes sense. To, tomorrow. Well, I feel a bit of relief right now, tomorrow. 
But we'll get to that in a second. But watch this. So then the Lord says to Moses, before the frogs come, this is how it happens. He says, raise that staff. What is it that you've got in your hand? Raise that staff in your hand over the rivers and the canals and the ponds and bring up all the frogs. The very thing that he said, would you lay that before me so I can use it? is the very thing, when you read through these 10 plagues, that every time he says, okay, now use your staff and touch the dust, and there's gnats. Could you imagine that? Dust, gnats. You can't count them. You couldn't breathe, guys. Have you ever swallowed a fly? A michi? A, I don't know what they are in English, I don't even know. What is that? A gnat. A gnat, I suppose that's what it is, right? You know, you can't, you can't function like that. He says, raise your staff. And then over and over through all these plagues, the flies, the livestock, he goes, raise your your, your staff, touch this, do that, do that. And every way throughout these plagues that he's trying to get Pharaoh's attention, it's the same thing that God said, will you use that? Will you you throw that down? Because it's not your stick that's doing it in the end of the day. It's not your talent. It's not your gifting. It's not your lack. It's not the nothingness that you're carrying around. It's me. If you would just put it down, watch me work in you and through you. See, it's important to understand that what we have in our hands is going to determine what God's going to do to touch a nation. It's done all the days where we can live small lives thinking we just need to raise our family. Because do you know the way you raise your family will affect a school, will affect a community, will affect their children? So the things that you're pouring your lives into is affecting a nation. And so God's calling for you is so much bigger and you've got to start seeing bigger that, that every time you've disciplined when you're not wanting to discipline, it's because you're preparing for a nation changer, a hope bringer, a, an encourager to, to lift somebody out of the, the deepest, darkest places that they've ever been to sort of say, okay, I'll keep on going. Somebody who says, I've never encountered somebody like you. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're actually having an effect on the nation. Who would have thought so many, we're not even expats, So many real South African, British, authentic British people are sitting here thinking, I'm I'm going to change the nation. God called me to London to make an impact and a difference. Now, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And the things that you're doing is having an impact on the kingdom of God, number one. And number two, it will change a nation. When the kids get together, when the youth rise up, when the parents start parenting the godly ways, when you start sitting on and saying, God, this is what your word says, and so I want my life to line up with these things. And so it has an outworking. See, if you carry on reading the, the, the process that God takes Pharaoh through, it's const, there's a constant a sort of battle that goes on. He goes, okay, 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 deal with it. You, you can do what you need to do. Just, let, just take this away. And as soon as there's a bit of ease, he, he reverts back to sin. And he, ha- he hangs on, he's like, actually, I've changed my mind. And there's this constant thing, like just when you think, okay, okay, uh, I caught you out, or, or okay, I got over that one, or pff, at least we, we, that's rid. He didn't understand the severity of what was going on. I've, I'm totally lost in my notes, so I'm just going to carry on going through the Bible, right? That's the notes, right there. And so what happens through all of these things is that there's always people that witness and can see God in a moment. Pharaoh's heart was so hard that he did not. That he put his entire empire at risk because he wouldn't just let the people go. Yes, God's hand was in it, but why was God's hand in it? See, the thing is, in, in, in Exodus 9, it gets to the point where it says, those officials of Pharaoh, first plague, second plague, gets to the point where there's some hail, terrible hail, And he says, go and get your livestock, Pharaoh, because hail's going to come and it's going to take them out. People, livestock, plants, farms, everything. Pharaoh's like, I will not. But there were people, his own officials that said, hang on, Pharaoh, do you not see what's going on here? Can you not see the mighty, powerful acts of God? Are you so closed to what God is revealing to you that you, you, can you not get it? But it says, they go out. His own people, the people who would have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that would understand, they go out and they get their their, um, slaves and their livestock inside because they fear God. They're like, actually, actually something's happening here. Pharaoh is not seeing this, but I'm seeing this. This God who we know nothing about. 
This God who means nothing to us is more powerful than anything we've ever seen. And so what happens is God says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. You need to let go of something. But his heart is so hardened that he's got no eyes, no concept to see the outworking of his decision in the people's lives around him. That is incredible. But there are people that say to him, Pharaoh, how long are you going to let this carry on? But he just couldn't. He just couldn't drop it. And it gets, there's this conversation where Moses says to Pharaoh, once again, okay, are you ready? Are you ready to let the people go? And he goes, yeah, 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 I am. Just pray to God like to take this away because I know now God takes it away. Your God brings it and he takes it away. Take it away. And Moses says, I will. I'll pray, but I know your hearts are still not soft towards God. You still don't fear God. God will go to any length and he's a patient God to get people's hearts. He is after our hearts, guys. What's in your hands? What's in your hearts? Is my question for us today. He did not hold back. The thing that he wanted to not, he didn't want Pharaoh to just go, fine, whatever, and still not have an understanding of who the almighty God was. Because Pharaoh could have let, him, let them go, which he did, and he regretted and he tried to get them back. But he wanted him to know and understand who he was dealing with. Our journeys with God is not just, yeah, yeah, a little prayer, salvation, Jesus died on the cross, somebody took my place, you know, when we don't understand what he took our place for. It becomes just a very distant thing. And so Moses says to him, I understand this, but we're not done yet because your heart is still not in the right place, Pharaoh. Your heart is still so hard that you, you think it's just, a, okay, fine, I'll give in to it. But God actually wants you to know who he is. He chases after the furthest heart. And he says, I will harden it so that not only you, but the Israelites, there was a process to sort of say, can the Israelites understand who I am? That if I would do all of this to get them out of captivity, would they be able to take us through their journey of the wilderness into the promised land? Would they understand what it is? And so he allows this process to unfold. See, how many of us, because of hardened hearts, and it happens instantly, it happens overnight. It happens when we don't deal with something. It happens when we, have, we wake up and we're just frustrated or irritated or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a journey. You know, you have a bad day and another bad day and you never deal, you didn't have time to deal with that thought and somebody else says it, you know, and, and the news explodes when you see things. And it's just, the enemy will take every opportunity to keep us in that place where our hearts just generally just, you know, start off soft and then grow hard. But what happens is like, Pharaoh gets to the point where he goes, okay, okay fine, I, I see what you're saying, but can we deal with it tomorrow? Why would we postpone God's deliverance, his healing, his wholeness, by one day just because we want to hang on to something we're not ready to let go of? See, Pharaoh thought, you've got to understand the other side of the story. This is his empire. This was a massive loss to him. This was his slaves. These were the people that built what he was ruling and reigning. There was a cost to let go of the thing that God's saying, you need to let those things go. Those people, your slaves, those entities, however it is, he knew there was value in them, even though he treated them like they had none. He knew that they would, they would, they would benefit him some. Actually, a lot they have. And so he, he knew that the cost of God saying, you need to let this go, this thing that is actually serving your own purpose, you need to let it go. This thing that you think you have the right to hang on to, he's like, these are my people, they are my slaves. They work for me. And God says, you know what? It's time for you to let that go. But the longer he hung on to the very thing that God says, it's time, let it go so that there could be worship, so that there could be reconciliation, so that my people would know me the more things happened and unfolded. See, the thing is, God wants to do something in our today. Don't be like Pharaoh and says, okay, tomorrow. Can we deal with it tomorrow? When God says, why would you want to live with frogs in your plate for one more day? What is in your heart? Because God is a very, very patient man. See, it gets to the point where this conversation keeps going out and Pharaoh chases Moses out of his sight and out of his palace and then Moses comes back in again and then it's just this long negotiation of 
just hardness and, and frustration is like, how hard is this Pharaoh? Just do what he's asking you to do. And Pharaoh's like, I don't even know this God and I don't want to do this. And this back and forward and it gets to the point, he goes, fine, who do you want to take with you? Probably just your men. So Moses says, no, I want it all. Isn't that the most amazing thing? We serve a God who will not just settle for the sum, for those who are willing and the easy ones that could come. He says, who do you want? Just your men, I assume. You don't need the children because God would really need to go with you. It says that. God would really need to go with you if you want your children and your wives as well. So just take the men and then you can do that. And he's like, no ways. No ways. I want to take the men, the women, the children, all the cattle, all the livestock. If we go, we all go. Because Jesus didn't just die for some to be saved. He came in and he says, so that every single person, and it's by his mercy and his grace that he hasn't come back and wrapped it up because he's waiting. He's waiting and things are happening in the earth, guys. Things of wars and rumors of wars and brokenness and things that are happening. And he's like, I will wait until people understand that there is a true living God. I will wait until every single heart that will return to me so that we can all go. There's not just for some that the promised land is. And I don't want to leave one behind. We sing these songs. He leaves the 99 for the one. He's like, the 99 are safe. So he's going to go after that one. He's like, no, Pharaoh, you don't get it. I'm not here for just the men. I'm not here for just the chosen few. I'm here for every single one of them. And more than that, I'm there for their livestock and their blessing and also your gold and your silver, all of it. See, when we drop the things God says to let go of, we can learn from Pharaoh's life as well. Let my people go. What's in your heart? What are you carrying? What is, what is it that's, that's causing you to hang on to something that's actually having an interference with the way God wants you to worship? Because worship is an exchange, it's a relationship, it's a, it's a communion, there's an openness, there's a flow. Because when we don't drop the things that God says to let go of, or when we do, we make a way for worship. We clear our hearts, we purify our hearts, we come before him and then there's open communion with him. God is after our hearts. In Proverbs 4, 23, or 4 verse 23, it says, so above all, guard the affections of your heart for they are all that you are and pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being for from there flows the wellspring of life. See, it gets to the point when we're not ready to deal with or let go of, the things, it has an effect on people around us. But the positive thing of that as well, because there's always two sides, guys, is when we are, God can use that very thing that's in our heart, that's in our hand, to bring healing, restoration, and a future for people. But when it's not, it can cause a bit of chaos and frustration and hurt. And so Pharaoh's people start pleading with him, saying, come on, Pharaoh, can you not see it? We can see it, come on, Pharaoh, our choices always affect more than who we are. Our behavior, the things that we hold on to, the things that we won't let go of. When we respond in obedience to God, we have God's ways of living, we create pathways for other people to benefit. Your generosity that you don't even think about has an effect on somebody else on the other side of the world. Your serving, your, your coming alongside, your encouragement, you never know what God would do. Your forgiveness. See, the thing is, just, we're as, just as Pharaoh had to think, these guys are mine and I owe, they owe me something. Like I look after these servants. There's, there's a very real thing that we can learn from Pharaoh as well because sometimes, you know, forgiveness, anger, all these things that we don't really talk about much in church anymore, or some people do, we don't often. All those things, God's like, if you would just do, would, would you deal with that? Would you just deal with that even though you feel that there's a right because something was done to you or there's a right you earned the permission to hold on to them as, as slaves? And so all that happens is all this breakout and stuff around, like, why live like that? But we do do it, guys. I've been there. Even in the last few weeks, coming home from South Africa, you know, and you're getting back into the swing of things and things happen and you get to the point where you're thinking, why am I just feeling a little bit just heavy? Have you, have you ever stopped and think, oh, I'm heavy or, or uh, I'm, I'm just feeling a bit low? Have you ever thought about how you're feeling? You guys are looking at me like you never did. You wake up happy every day thinking, I'm so happy. Today I'm happy. I'm happy today. I'm happy tomorrow. Or have you ever thought, oh, 
This is a bit of a harder day. Anybody? Talk to me. What do you do in those moments? Do you just go, it's a harder day, I'm just going through a hard season, let's push through. Or do you actually say, God, I'm going through a hard season, I'm going through a bit of a hard day, let's deal with this. Because I tell you what, it's easy to just go through those hard days for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks, and not even say, God, please, can you help me? Can you, whatever, tell me what it is, what can I do to, to deal with this? Just, and in a moment, this is the thing about God. It is the easiest thing to step back into that ease with Him. It is the easiest thing when you're feeling like you're pulling the oxen and you've, you're not even just doing that, you're carrying the oxen, the yoke and everything that's carrying around, hanging around it to the point of saying, actually, God, I'm putting it down. Like this, there is instant relief. There is instant restoration. There's instant just, okay, all right, we can carry on doing it, even though you still have a journey to walk. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Don't put up with things that bring oppression and frustration and irritation and stuff because it's just going to trip you up and it's not going to produce the very thing that your heart is longing for. So in conclusion, the saddest part or the tragedy of responding like Pharaoh does as opposed to the way Moses responds is that Pharaoh's heart was so hardened that he actually became unresponsive to God that it didn't matter what was going on. He just couldn't let it go. And God's saying, if you would just let my people go. And so we need to, we need to warfare over our hearts. We need to warfare over the things that God has given us. We need to take, take them as, as gifts and privileges, saying, God, I, I wanna use this. I wanna use my heart, position it before you so that I can see your people worship. God, I don't wanna live with plagues that destroy lives and my life, my, the way we're living now. Please believe me, God is a good God. I'm not saying that he's gonna just heap calamities on you. He's like, why put up with something that you don't need to put up with when the answer is very clear? I'm talking about those things. He's told you. He tells us, deal with this, sort this out, keep your heart pure. See, the thing is in Hebrews, God reminds us of the story and he says, this is what you can learn from them. If only today you would listen to my voice. If only today, whether you find yourself where Moses is, where you're thinking, God, I don't know what it is that you're gonna ask me to do, but your assignment is great. But God, help me be willing to lay it down, whatever it is. Or you find yourself in a place, in a moment, and I tell you what, your destiny is not forever where Pharaoh is, but it's a moment, it's a decision, it's a one, it's a moment by moment, and you're going, ah, I'm finding this hard, God, I'm finding this hard to let this go. I just can't shake it, and I don't know how to get deal with it. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. God's reminder today is only today would you listen to me. Don't be, make him hang, angry by hardening your hearts, like the people did in Israel. There the fathers tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years, they still doubted me. They ignited my anger within the generation when I said to them, they wonder in their hearts just like they do with their feet and refuse to learn my ways. So search your hearts every day, my brothers and sisters, and make sure that none of you has unbelief or evil hiding in your heart, for it will lead you astray and make you unresponsive to the living God. This is the time to encourage one another, never to be stubborn or hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, both of them were asked, put it down. Both of them. The one was to change a nation and the other one had the exact same opportunity to change the future of a nation. The one laid it before God and God used him mightily and he goes down as Moses, the man who led them out of Egypt in captivity. And Pharaoh, the guy that pays the ultimate price and he loses his son and the nation falls to ruins because he could not. So I pray today that we would be people that would be able to give over the things. Do you know the things that it might not be plagues as in sickness and, and attack and terrorism and stuff in your life, but it could be something in your heart that's plaguing you. It could be a frustration. It could be your thoughts. It could be your mind. It could be whatever it is. And God's going, don't put up with it for one more day. Purify your hearts. Deal with what's in it. Because from there is the overflow, the outworking. And for those of you who are discouraged, you have, God, God has got a very different operating standard procedures in his kingdom. 
And so we're going to overcome by coming in the opposite spirit. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage somebody else. When you don't feel like it, do it. When you're feeling like you've got lack, give. When you're feeling like you don't know what the next step is, pray for somebody else. There's this opposite thing. That's, where, that's how we combat it because you're never going to fight the enemy on the enemy's terms. But he has no idea what's going to happen when you swing his curveball and going, you saying, be depressed, sit there on your thing and, and sulk about it. And, and God's going, why don't you just put on praise and focus on me? Because it will change immediately. So I just pray for you today. I pray for me today that we would let it go, that we would, ch- we would throw it down before God's feet. Saying, if you're saying, God, whatever it is I need to let go, I'll let go. Whatever it is that I need to hand over, I will hand over. Because I want to be used in the assignment of changing a nation. Amen? And so, Father, I just thank you that today, that your spirit would do what your spirit needs to do. Father God, I pray that my words would not complicate and, and, and contradict and and just cause confusion, but Father, the clarity with which you want to speak to our hearts, God, whether it's somebody that's discouraged today, whether it's somebody that needs just a bit of encouragement or, or hope or, or, or just being able to see that the reward is so much greater than the thing that we're hanging on to, but God, whatever it is today, Father, our hearts are open and bare before you. Father, I pray for pure hearts and clean hands. God, I pray that in this church, Father, we would be people that would always guard our hearts. We would take note of what's going on. We would be able to position ourselves saying, God, whatever it is that you need, Father, help us lay it before your throne. Help us see that the things that you've called us to, God, and, and, and our gifts and the assignment don't line up, but Father, you close that gap. Father, I pray that if we find ourselves in a place where we're just finding it hard to let go, God, I, I ask you, Father, that you would be sovereign in those moments that your greatness, Father God, that we would...